أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه خاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء الحسنى وهل أتاك حديث موسى إذ رأى نارا فقال لأهلهم كثوا إني آنست نارا لعلي آتيكم منها بقبس أو أجد على النار هدى فلما أتاها نودي يا موسى إن أني, إني أنا ربك فاخلع عليك إنك بالواد المقدس طوى أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته one of the common usages of an applications that are adopted by human beings in their lives is the utilization of medication. You and I often require some kind of medical help in the form of drugs or medicines as they call them to improve our health and our illness and our situation that we may Go through. But imagine that you have either purchased some medications or have received a prescription from the doctor, your general practitioner, and you have gone home with the medications, with the prescription, and you simply place it right in front of you. So you don't do anything with it whatsoever. You put it for viewing. You place it on a shelf and you look at it. And the next day you observe the medications or the prescription and the third day you tell people about the medications but you never take that step into taking the medications swallowing the medicines getting those prescriptions filled at the pharmacy and the result of course is that it's likely that your illness will be prolonged and that you will not be cured or it will not be of benefit to you, the medications that you have obtained if you are not willing to take them. When you and I recite Dua Kumail by, of course, as narrated from the Holy First Imam, the commander of the faithful Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the fine, one of the final things that we say in Dua Kumail is, Ya man ismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa. O the one whose name is medicine, it's like medicine, but his remembrance is the healing. So the idea is that the names of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Asma'ul Husna are what? Are like medicines. Yet the application of the Asma of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, starting with its utterance, is the one that causes and brings about that spiritual as well as physical healing. And Allah wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran in Surah Taha, ayah number 8, Allah la ilaha illa huwa lahul asma'ul husna. Allah to Allah belongs the great exalted names. There's one final thing to mention about asma'ul husna of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, the absolute perfect being, before entering into the most referred to and most discussed story in the Holy Quran, and that is the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. That notion is of Ismullah al-A'zam, the great name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, of course, Ismullah al-A'zam is a phenomenal aspect when it comes to the exalted names of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, because often what you find is people are searching for it, people are looking for it. And at the same time, they considered a special code, they consider it a special utterance that brings about answering of the dua, that brings about uh, the fulfillment of one's requirements and deeds and so on. 
And uh, we have a number of very important narrations that give us an idea about this Ismullah al-A'zam, the great name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look like in supplications, uh, we have often this concept is referred to. Uh, you have in Dua is Samat, this beautiful supplication, Dua is Samat. This is what's referred to Allahumma inni as'aluka bismika al azim al a'zam. Oh Allah, ask you, I ask you in your great exalted name. Al ajal al akram, al ladhi idha du'ita bihi ala maghaliqi abwa is sama lil fathi bil rahmatin fatahat. I ask you by your great name the exalted majestic name that if I supplicate using it and I ask using it for the heavens to open up with the mercy of God it will do so it's amazing this name that is a uh, so powerful so profound that just referring to it opens up the heavens for the human being now in the story of Sulaiman this great prophet of God, we have this character by the name of Asif ibn Barkhiya, whom of course was one of the awliyaullah, one of those who was given a number of blessings by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Sulaiman said, who will get me the throne of Bilqis? One of the jinn said, I will get it before you rise from your position where you are. Yes, before you finish this session. Sulaiman used to have these sessions where he would meet with the pe people and he would deal with their problems and so on. So this jinn would say, I would get you the throne of Bilqis, the queen of Sheba, before you rise. Asif ibn Barkhiya would say to him, I would get it for you before the blink of an eye. Now, riwayat say Asif had one letter from the Ismullah al-A'zam. Just one letter from this great name of God. And with that one letter, he was able to do this. Yeah. Some narrations point that Ismullah al-A'zam is found in Surah Al-Hamd, Surah Al-Fatiha. Other narrations say that it is found in the Basmala. So for instance, we find the narration from Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. إن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أقرب إلى الاسم الأعظم من بياض العين إلى سوادها. That بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم is so close to this great name of God, then the whiteness of the eye to the black part. It's incredibly close. Yes. We have a narration in the book بصائر الدرجات from Imam Sadiq عليه السلام that a man by the name of Amr ibn Hanzala. Asked the Imam, he said, Yabna Rasulillah, Alimni al Ismil Avam. Can you teach me that great name? I want to know. You know? Imam Ali Salam said to him, If I teach you, will you bear it? Are you able to withstand it? He said, Yes, it's just a name. I could take it. No problem. Imam said, Come with me. They went to a house, according to this narration, they went to a house. Imam Ali Salam placed his holy hand onto the ground, and all of a sudden, Perhaps there was a candle, perhaps there was some other form of lighting, maybe it was the sunlight. It went completely dark to the extent that this Amr ibn Hamdallah was not able to see anything and he was petrified just simply by Imam placing his hand onto the ground. Yes? So the Imam says to him, Do you bear it? Amr said, No, no, I don't bear it. Imam Ali Salam placed his hand onto the ground again and it lit up how it was before. We have in the book At Tawheed Lis Saduq. Shaykh al Sadu, that a narration from the commander of faithful Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he said, Ra'aytu al Khidr fi al Manam. I saw Khidr, Prophet Khidr, in my dream, Amir al Mu'mineen says, Qabla Badr al on the night of the battle of Badr. I said to him, Alimni shay'an unsaru bihi ala al A'da'. Teach me something that I will use to be victorious against the enemies. What happened? فَقَالَ قُلْ So Khidr said to whom? To Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said to him, say this. يَا مَنْ لَا هُوَ إِلَّا هُ Oh, the one who no one 
is him except him. Ya man la huwa illa hu. Imam alayhi salam says, فَلَمَّا أَصْبَحْتُ قَصَصْتُهَا عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم In the morning, I went and informed the Holy Prophet about what I saw. I said, Khidr, I asked him for something to help me in the battle of Badr, and he told me this. He said, recite this. Ya man la huwa illa hu. Faqal, and Nabi صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم said, Ya Ali, علمت الاسم الأعظم. You have been taught the great name of God. Now the brothers and sisters are wishing that I wrote it down. Huh? But just bear with me as we go through the different narrations that exist regarding this area. We have a number of hadith, for instance, from Imam Sadiq salam in Al-Kafi, volume 1, page 230, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Ismul A'zam to some of his chosen servants. However, this great name has 73 letters, 72 letters of which have been given to the Prophet and the Imams. One letter, the remaining letter, he has kept for himself. So no one has that knowledge. Yeah. And you'll find so many other references to this great name. And people often ask, I want it, I want to use it in dua. It's like a special code. Yeah. Now, what is it in reality? And I don't want to take a lot, uh, unlike the discussion about Arsh, which we took the whole session. I don't want to take the whole session discussing th uh, the great name of God. Just to say this, that imagine that there is a vault or a safe which has a code. Yes, a special passcode. And this code is given to a child. Here you go. This is a code to the biggest safe in the world, which has the greatest wealth or money. Right? Imagine what the child would do with that. Nothing. They don't know how to use it. They don't know what to do with it. They'll just, yeah, they'll just read it out maybe or place it somewhere, okay? They will not be able to apply it and to utilize it exactly where it should be used. They don't know there's a vault out there, there is a safe out there, they need to go and enter it. They're a child, they've just been given this without explanation of what this code or this passcode in reality is. And some of the scholars have come forward and said, yes, we have so many narrations that point to Ismullah al-A'zam, but why is it if I'm about to come forward and say, Ya man la huwa illa hu, and ask for my hajat, they're not fulfilled. Surely if I mention the Ismullah al-A'zam, if it's that code, it's immediately answered. Some of the Mufassireen like Allama Tabatabai have come forward and said, it is not a collection of letters. It is not verbal or how you and I have associated this great name with semantics or something that can be written, yes? It is the ma'rifa and the secrets of the existence in this universe, yeah? And the meanings behind it, yeah? So it's the impact of this great name of God. It's the understanding and the profound nature of this exalted name of God. And the knowledge of it that is given to certain individuals that apply it and know how to use it. Unlike, you know, the idea of a word that is simply said and it's like abracadabra and all of a sudden the cave opens up. No, it's not like that. And this points to a a phenomenal concept, this idea that, you know, people are often very intrigued about the night of Qadr. When is the night of Qadr? 19th, 21st, 23rd, and so on and so forth. But, of course, the individuals who have a deeper and more profound relationship with God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're not as concerned about the actual night, more so what they can achieve on one of those nights. The ma'rifa, the change, the transformation, the quality of their deeds and their actions. Yeah? Rather than, you know what, 
it's tonight, I have three hours, oh my God, I haven't read Dua Joshua and Kabir, I haven't done this, I've got 10 minutes left, I'm not going to eat tonight, I'm going to do this. And you know, packing, packing a'mal, alhamdulillah, I've done all the a'mal, tick for this year, for the hafiz. Yes, that's the mentality that some of us have, that it's the night of Qadr, let's do as much, yes. I'm not saying we shouldn't, of course we should utilize every minute, but Islam teachings always focus upon quality more than the quantity, isn't it? Now, there's a very important story that highlights the significance of Ismullah al-A'zam, and that is um, that there was um, uh, once Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and possibly Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba, peace and blessings be upon them all, were in Masjid al-Haram, in, uh, next to the Holy Kaaba. And it was at night time. It was dark and they were there alone, or they thought they were there alone, and what happened was they were hearing somebody who was crying and weeping profusely, beseeching God for forgiveness. Amir al says to Imam al Hussein, go and find out why this person is crying so much. And Imam al Hussein goes, he says, I saw somebody who smelt nice, who looked very presentable, but was crying and crying and weeping and shedding the tears. And when I came close to him, I saw that half of his body was paralyzed. So I said to him, what is your story? Why is it that you're crying in such a way? My father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, wants to see you. So he said, we, I took him to see Amir al-Mu'mineen and he explained his story to us. His story was that, you know, I am a youth, a young man who was very often, very much often into sinning. I was continuously disobedient of God, the Almighty, and I was committing um, this uh, act of transgression, transgressions against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, my father, who was righteous, was continuously telling me not to do this, advising me, admonishing me, but I would not listen. Until one day, I decided to leave the house to take some money, and uh, this belonged to my father. When he tried to stop me, I pushed him. And some other riwayat said, I used to hit him. Until the extent was that my father decided to go to, to come here next to the holy house of God, next to the Kaaba, and to pray to Allah to punish me. He was so upset with me that I was using physical force against him that he came and prayed. He says, as soon as he prayed, I was paralyzed, half paralyzed. So the dua of my father was answered. And then I besieged him and I said, oh my father, I want you to ask Allah to forgive me and I'm repentant. When we went back, he went, came back home and he agreed and we decided to come together to Mecca so that he would pray in the same place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cure me. He says, on the way, my father was on the camel. There was a bird that flew. Somehow it scared the camel and the camel somehow fell and my father also fell and he died. And that forgiveness was never obtained. And of course, Amir al-Mu'mineen taught him this dua known as dua al-mashlul. Some of you, of course, have um, heard of this particular dua that is, of course, found in Mustadrak al-Wasail and several other books. Beautiful dua. And the narration says, Fihi ismullah al-a'zam. In this dua, you'll find the great name of God. Ismullah al-A'zam. And of course, when Amir al-Mu'mineen taught this individual this dua, he recited it. After a few times, he was cured. After a few times, he was cured. However, this could also indicate or point towards the discussion surrounding the essence and the meanings behind what you and I utter and what you and I say and whether we understand it. We appreciate its applications, and that in reality is part of the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to certain individuals. Because once there was a man who came to a mystic, Arif, he said to him, Alimni al ism al a'zam. I want to know, you know, you guys seem to have some idea. Sometimes, you know, you, you say certain things or you do certain things. He said, Before I do so, can you go and get me some water from the sea? They were living close to the seaside. So this individual goes to the sea, tries to take some water from the sea, and all of a sudden, he sees, whilst he's at the shore, a huge shark approaching. Yes? When he finds the shark, he wants to run away from, you know, next to the seaside. 
As he turns, he finds a lion standing there. So he's either going to be savaged by a lion or eaten by a shark. Which one would he choose? Yes? So at that moment, what did he do? He waited there and just looked up and says, Ya Allah. That's all he said. Complete submission to Allah. That's it. Submitted himself to Allah. It's only Allah that could save him. Yes? What happened? The, 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 the lion jumped to try and kind of grab him. As he ducked, he said, Ya Allah, and he ducked. The lion fell into the water, and as the shark was attacking, they both got into each other's grips. And he started to walk away. He came and informed this particular individual. He said, this is the story. That individual said to him, what did you say? He said, I said, Ya Allah. He said, you said, Ya Allah, and are asking me for Ismullah al-A'zam. The key thing here is, of course, how that individual understood what Ya Allah means. Because sometimes when we say Ya Allah, we have other thoughts in our minds. In other words, X, Y, and Z will sort it out for me. But Ya Allah, I'm used to saying it. Or I'm used to asking Allah for my hajat. Yes, but I, do I really believe that it's he who will make it happen? Or do I associate partners with him? And so this is just an example of how Ismullah al-A'zam can be understood. When we look at the Holy Quran, we find the most outstanding story is the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Mentioned in 34 chapters of the Holy Quran, 100 and 36 times in the Holy Quran, Musa is mentioned by name. How many? 136 times. It's indeed, it's the most referred to narrative in the Holy Quran. And uh, not only is the story of Musa so common in the Holy Quran, it's also found in the Bible, in the first five books of the Bible. And you find that Several chapters, Surah Al-A'raf, for instance, Surah Taha, Surah Al-Baqarah, refer to the story of this great prophet of God, Moses. There are so many fascinating dimensions of the story of Musa, alayhi salam. There is the political dimension, the spiritual dimension, the sociological dimension, the theological dimension. It makes it really intriguing and quite interesting. Um, to discuss this particular story as it is discussed in, in Surah uh, Taha. But what is fascinating as well is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَتْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ نَبَئِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ The Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that we tell you from the story of Musa. And it's very important for us at the outset when we are now delving into this really uh, beautiful narrative in the Holy Quran to appreciate this. The Quran is not a book of storytelling. It's not a novel. The Quran is talking about the philosophy of religion. Philosophy of religion is basically the concepts, the ideas, the principles, the values, the lessons. The factual aspects to be taken. And therefore the Quran says, نَتْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ نَبَئِ مُوسَى From the news of Musa. Quran is not concerned with irrelevant parts of the story of Musa. Everything that is mentioned about Musa السلام, in the Quran is relevant to each and every individual till the day of judgment. It is not just simply storytelling. Yes, and that's part of the idea of the uh, philosophy of Religion, what is relevant and what is needed in the lives of human beings is mentioned about every prophet that is found in the Holy Quran, definitely. The second point, of course, to mention is, some people have said, of course, if Musa is mentioned 136 times, are there any repetitions of the story? And some people might think, yes, you know, an examination of, this, of the verses or the story itself somehow points to that idea. Yet, on closer reflection, you'll find that in each chapter, a very unique dimension is examined. Yeah? 
And no doubt there is no repetition in the Holy Quran. Every word, every letter has a particular purpose. And the style is also different. In Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't start with the birth of Musa. Starts with the initiation of the what? Of the movement of Musa alayhi salam towards Fir'aun to invite him towards the path of righteousness. In certain other chapters, it focuses on Fir'aun himself. Yes? In other areas in Surah Baqarah, it talks about Bani Israel and the community of Bani Israel in reference to Musa alayhi salam. So there are many different dimensions and the style is fascinating. It's, it's completely different. It's not the same at all. Story of Prophet Musa, in order for us to have an understanding, let's have a few uh, minutes to reflect on the background of Musa alayhi salam as far as Bani Israel are concerned. Bani Israel, a community that is often mentioned in the Holy Quran. There are uh, some who believe that there is a chapter in the Holy Quran known as Surah Bani Israel, although that is more commonly known as Surah Al-Isra. Some others have said this is known as Surah Bani Israel. There are important dimensions about the story of Bani Israel in the Holy Quran, like for instance, the story of Jalut that is found in Surah Al-Baqarah. You find the actual story regarding the naming of this largest chapter of the Holy Quran, Baqarah, as well as the um, story of Yusuf, Ya'qub, his brothers, the brothers of Yusuf, alayhi salam, and so on, you'll find many aspects of the story of this particular tribe. Now, Bani Israel comes from the word Israel, which means Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub was known, Prophet Ya'qub, Jacob, was known as Israel or Israel. And in Hebrew, Israel means worshipping God. Yeah, it means worshipping God. The Bani Israel are the children of this Prophet, the 12 tribes. Of course, he had 12 sons, and they uh, moved to Egypt after Prophet Yusuf السلام, had invited them to go there. They settled there and flourished. They learned the city life. They began to um, acquire the skills required to interact with others. Because remember, before that, they were nomads. They were living in deserts, not used to the hustle and the bustle of city life. Yeah? So these particular 12, 12 tribes originating from the 12, 12 sons of Ya'qub began to um, increase in number and spread in different areas. Ya'qub, before he passed away, said to them that there will be kings who will persecute you, who will oppress you, yeah? But there will be a child from one of my sons and his name is Lawi. So one of the sons of Ya'qub, his name is Lawi. Ya'qub said, one of his grandchildren, descendants, will be called Musa. And he will be the savior of Bani Israel. He anticipate his arrival because the kings, will, uh, the rulers will come and, and what? Plunge you into darkness and oppression. And therefore, wait for him, that savior. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting that uh, Bani Israel, they waited and waited and for 400 years they went in anticipation for this son of Lawi, great son of Lawi to come to the extent that narrations tell us that some of them used to name their sons Musa in the hope that's him. Yeah, in the hope that maybe he's the saviour. And of course, after 400 years, according to current archaeological um, deductions or analysis, Ramses II, because there were many pharaohs who used to, like we said, there are many kings and rulers who used to um, rule at that time. But Ramses II, who is known as Fir'aun in the Holy Quran, he has mentioned over 70 times, 7-0, uh, and if you think about it, there's no companion of the Holy Prophet that is mentioned other than Zayd, his adopted son, is mentioned once in the Quran. That's it. Yes, no other companion is mentioned by name. And the Prophet himself is mentioned four plus one. Four times with the blessed name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam.
and one with the name Ahmed. Yes? But when you look up, you look, you look at the story of Musa, it's fascinating how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in the Quran emphasis on this story. And if you think about it, the fact that it's in the Quran, it should mean that it's probably the most studied story that we have to focus upon alongside the seerah of the Holy Prophet. And then the, the need to reflect upon the fact that Allah wouldn't place it there except that it's very, very significant and incredibly relevant. And one of the reasons why we chose Surah Taha is because of this and the eloquent, of course, all the Quran is eloquent, but the beautiful dimensions that are discussed in this chapter of the Holy Quran regarding this story. Fir'aun, of course, came after 400 years and he was so ruthless that he decided to divide the community into two, the Copts, the Coptic Egyptians, and the Bani Israel. And uh, the Quran says, Inna Fir'aun ala fil ardi wa ja'ala ahlaha shia'a yastadhifu ta'ifatan minhum. Fir'aun was arrogant on this earth. What did he do? Wa ja'ala ardaha shia'a, not shia. Shia means to follow. Shia means to segments, parts, groups. So he divided them into two groups, yes? And he favored one over the other. So he enslaved Bani Israel to serve the Copts. And the Copts still, some of them are alive in Egypt. You know, they're mostly Christians, yeah? But what Fir'aun did was he created this caste system. He created this particular division in society. The story begins here in, cha in chapter 20, verse number 9, وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى I must mention though, it's fascinating for those who reflect and ponder, there are similarities between Bani Israel and the Muslim Ummah. And this requires some thought. Yeah? And one of the similarities that maybe one can uh, present uh, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says وَفَضَّنَّاكُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ That we have favored you over the worlds. Whom? Bani Israel. At that time. Allah wa ta'ala narration says sent them thousands of prophets. One after the other they came. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةِ We have given Bani Israel the prophethood and the books. So much that was given to this particular community. But of course, they were continuously rejecting and they were continuously denying the signs from God. But what is interesting is that some of the, our scholars have talked about the similarity that many Israelis share with the Muslim Ummah. And one of, that, one of those is the fact that they've been given so much and were honored, but they rejected this. And they turned against it. Yeah? They had this prophet of God known as Kalimullah, one of the five Ulul Azm. They were given thousands of other prophets, but the Quran tells us they were either killed, they were persecuted, they were not followed and rejected. And likewise, you notice how the Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny, the final and the greatest of messengers, and the one who brought forward the complete religion perfected the faith but what happened after he left this world how did people react to the prophet not being there yeah and uh, once inshallah maybe if we're still alive and maybe a month's time if we get there when we get to the story of the uh, Samiri when Musa alayhi salam left Bani Israel for 40 nights they turned against Musa and they worshipped this calf. Forty nights, that's it. Very similar, isn't it? Yes? That human beings have this tendency to follow an individual, but if this following and this uh, obedience, it's superficial, it evaporates overnight. 120,000 individuals on one day give bay'ah to Amir al muminin next to the Holy Prophet, and one of them says, Bakhin, Bakhin, Laka ya Ali. You have become my Mawla, my master, and the master of every believing man and woman. 120,000. Yes? Only two months and a few days later. 
Yeah? Two months and ten days. Spe particularly, specifically. Two months and ten days. Not even, you know, a year or six months. Two months and ten days, only a handful are standing with Ali ibn Abi Talib. What happened to the others? And so we can draw these similarities from the story of uh, uh, Bani Israel, and without a doubt, the fact that it's mentioned in the Quran so many times has some kind of connection to the what to the Muslim Ummah. hadithu Musa. Have you heard about the story of Musa? Question: Why is Allah said? Have you heard about the story of Musa? Why that style? Yeah? This is a beautiful way to draw attention. You know, sometimes you say to a certain number of people, Did you hear about this? Have you come across this notion? Yeah? You are attracting them towards something which is of profound importance, something of great significance. وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Come listen, come to ponder, come to take heed from this particular uh, story. Therefore, it is a method of drawing attention, number one. Number two, but more importantly, the Qur'an continuously says that we have placed the stories of prophets, and of course the stories in the Qur'an are distinguished from other books for two main reasons. We have to understand this. Number one, they're factual. They cannot accept any falsehood. There is no, no falsehood that comes to the stories of the Quran, no doubt. But secondly, of course, it's not for the sake of enjoyment. People are not reading this story for the sake of fun, but rather because of its applications in people's lives. Therefore, the Quran says, I, Allah says, I want to remind you continuously about these particular stories. Look at Surah Maryam. It's fascinating in Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمْ وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مُوسَى وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلْ وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِدْرِيس Five individuals, Allah says, وَذْكُرْ Remind, remember, keep people's attention focused on these individuals and others. Why? Because human beings are forgetful creations of God, isn't it? Al-insan min al nisyan In Arabic, al-insan comes from the being that often forgets. And that's why the Quran is a dhikr, dhikra. Yes? The key thing here though is, when it comes to the stories of the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously says, وَذَكِّرْ وَذْكُرْ هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Remind people. Why? Here, the school of Ahl al-Bayt has said, this demonstrates the importance of keeping these individuals, their lives, their teachings alive continuously and upholding their days. Yeah? Because, of course, there is uh, a particular school that has hijacked the religion of Islam and has come forward and said it's bid'ah, it's shirk. It's unacceptable to hold these days of remembrance for personalities, for per holy personalities, for individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen and has praised and so on. And there is no basis for it. And the school of Ahl al-Bayt says, well, you look at the Holy Quran, it's continuously seeking to take us back. Yeah? And uh, the Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةِ Ibra means two things. It means a lesson, but it also means a bridge. The Quran wants us to somehow connect how a bridge connects two areas. Yeah? So you can go from one area to another. Allah wa ta'ala wants us to connect to the time of the prophets. Yes? And the awliya, the imams alayhim salam in order for them and their lives to actually mean something to us. When we don't, when the Quran says, وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى It means Musa should not be somebody whom we recite in the month of Ramadan or when we picked up the Quran for istikhara. Oh, the story of Musa has come up. 
Or when I'm reading a novel. Oh, you know, I'm interested in reading the story of Musa. No. Musa, when I'm going through the story of Musa, I should continuously be soul-searching and scrutinizing myself and says, if I was in the position of Musa, what would I have done? What would have been my position? Yusuf, Ibrahim, Isa, Nuh, Idris, all the prophets of God, 25 or 26. If I was in their position, what would have been my task? And what does it mean to me today? And it's very interesting that when you look at the story of Musa in relation to this chapter, remember that just in inverted brackets, we say that in Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the days of the birth and the days of the death of individuals are holy. And the proof is in chapter 19, verse 33, Isa alayhi salam says, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وَلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبْعَثُ حَيَّا Peace be upon me. On the day I was born, on the day I die, and the day I will be resurrected. Also in Yahya alayhi salam, also the same chapter, Surah Maryam, verse number 15, وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ وَلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ يُبْعَثُ حَيَّا Allah sending blessings and peace on the day of his birth. In addition to the idea that he wants us to remember these holy individuals, yes, we uphold them and we uphold their anniversaries of the birth and their passing away, their martyrdom, and this brings us closer to their personalities and, of course, ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're referred to as Ayyamullah, the days that belong to Allah. The Quran says, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ Allah." Remind them about the days that are specifically belonging to God, that through the remembrance of the individuals, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed remembered. Now, Surah Taha is a Meccan surah. Yes? 80 ayat in the Holy Quran, 8-0 in Surah Taha are in relation to the story of Musa. 80. Okay? Why? It's interesting when you look at Asbab al-Nuzul, the cause of the revelation of this particular chapter, you'll find that it was at the time where Muslims were going through incredible hardship and difficulty. When they were being tortured, when their rights were being taken away, they were going through hard times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how wonderful the Quran is, and how beautiful are the instructions and the commands of the Almighty. That he's revealed Surah Taha, yes, to say to the Muslims, that look at Musa alayhi salam. He went from ease, oh, actually from hardship to ease, to hardship to ease. Yes, and it's all in the hands of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all about qudra, the might and the power of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Despite what others do, no one can change the plan of God. And we will see that in the story of Musa. God the Almighty had a plan. And that plan would definitely happen. Whatever anyone, Fir'aun. What did Fir'aun do? Fir'aun was told, he saw in a dream, that what? That he would be challenged. How would he challenge? He saw in his dream his throne is burnt, is burning. So he said to the interpreters of the dream, what does that mean? They said there will be a son, there will be a boy who will be born amongst Bani Israel who will eventually defeat you. And you'll no longer be the Lord, as he said. Ana rabbukum al so what, of course, what did he decide to do? He said that uh, every pregnant woman should be monitored. And when she gives birth, if it's a boy, it will be killed straight away. And this happened, but look at the mercy of God and the plan of God. That the person whom Pharaoh feared, Pharaoh himself raised. That he was the cause for his own downfall. And that was the plan of God. Can you imagine? I mean, people talk about statistics and probabilities. Pharaoh is thinking, I'm okay. I'm going to kill every single child here. And that child will never grow. He will never defeat me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, place your trust in me and you will see wonders. Because there is a plan that he has, but he wants us to submit. And that's entirely the concept of taslim. That's entirely the concept of submission to Allah subhanahu 
wa ta'ala. And of course, the story of Musa given to the Prophet is one that helps him to seek inspiration and motivation to go on. And the, and the companions. Because can you imagine, I mean, you know, people like Yasir, you know, Ammar's father, yes, and Sumayya killed in such a particular way, their property is taken away, and so on and so forth. Sometimes people don't see light at the end of the tunnel. They're very despondent. And I would like to say here that perhaps sometimes we go through it ourselves amongst the community or the Muslim Ummah as we see it, yes? So much Islamophobia. We can no longer say that we desire an Islamic state. Whereas the, the hadith and the riwayat say, we should. Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema. This is dua al-iftitah. Oh Allah, we want an Islamic state. But look at how this the term, pure is term, Islamic state has been hijacked. Yes? In fiqh, we have so many principles in fiqh. They're called qa'ida. Yes? And all these terms that, look at where we are now. Jihadi John. And he's Kuwaiti. I don't know how they made him a John. Yes? Or Bedouin. The key thing today is incredible hardship, especially for the followers of Ahl al Bayt. Killed, imprisoned, rights taken away for one thing. I always say to people, it's not how they look, it's not what they eat, it's because of wilaya. That's it. Denounce wilaya, you're okay. Yes? Hardship, difficulty. But Allah has a plan. Individuals who do not give up individuals who recognize that you know that lady who stood in front of the tyrant and said Mara Aitu Illa Jamila, she knew that there is a plan. Otherwise, most of us would have said, I cannot believe this. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. How can you do this, this, this? But the lady stands in great courage and valor and says, Everything was amazing, beautiful. It's not something anyone could say. But Allah wa Taala says the story of Musa is one of those that illustrates the magnificent mercy of God and that his plan will eventually prevail. Despite the actions of humans, it will be something that will definitely happen. Very briefly, Allah wa Taala starts the story with the journey of Musa back from Madian. Later, we will talk about in detail his birth, what happened, the riwayat with that. But just a summary, of course, Musa alayhi salam, as, was, uh, as, as, as indicated in many parts of the Holy Quran, was saved from the wrath of Fir'aun, was picked up, of course, by Fir'aun or his wife, was raised in the palace of Pharaoh, and later saw two individuals fighting, one of them his Shia, and one of them a Copt. And when he tried to disperse them, one of them died. And therefore, Musa salam was on the run because he was accused of killing that copt. And he left, Median, uh, left Egypt, not knowing where to go. He continued his journey. He reached an area known as Median. He saw two ladies um, who were unable to take some water from the well. He helped them, then sat under a tree. And those two ladies, of course, were Leah and Safura, the daughters of Prophet Shu'aib. They went. Shu'aib called him, wanted to reward him, said, I will marry you to one of my daughters if you stay with me and serve and help for eight years. But if you stay for 10 years, that's even better. Musa decides to stay for 10 years. And after being raised in the palace, in particular style, with all the servants and being looked after, Musa went through what? went through 10 years of spiritual training. Went through 10 years under what? Shu'aib alayhi salam and the guidance of Shu'aib and the instructions of Shu'aib alayhi salam at least. And then he decided to go back to Egypt. And the Quran in Surah Taha begins from that particular juncture. But notice, this ayah before وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ Musa. 
is what? Allah la ilaha illa huwa lahu al asma al husna. So, what's the theme of this ayah? Tawheed. Oneness of God, monotheism. Yes? Allah la ilaha illa huwa lahu al asma al husna. If we go to the final ayah that talks about, or after the um, story of Musa alayhi salam in Taha. Okay. It's 97. So the final ayah of story of Musa in Surah Taha is ayah 97. Talking about a samari. The next ayah though, إِنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَاهَ إِلَّا هُوْ وَسَعَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا some of the Mufassireen have said it's amazing that the story of Musa is encapsulated by two ayat that talk about Tawheed, that talk about the oneness of God. Remember that one says, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa lahu al asma'ul husna. Everything is about Tawheed, everything is about purity of thought, oneness of God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, and illustrates. That Musa, one of his, of course, successes was the fact that he was a man of Tawheed, as were all the, indeed, all the prophets of God. إِذْ رَأَى نَارًا فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِهِمْ كُثُوا إِنِّي آنَسْتُ نَارًا Musa alayhi salam is now walking back or traveling back rather with his family towards Egypt. Who are his family? His wife. And according to narrations, it's a son that he had. He had a son. He was traveling together back. His wife was pregnant. And Musa deliberately did not take the path or the route back to Egypt that was common. So he was traveling in the desert in the routes that were unused because he was still aware that he was if he was captured it might impact his mission of saving Bani Israel and more importantly propagating the message of the oneness of God Tawheed and obedience to his prophets the prophets of the Almighty so he took an unconventional route it was cold his wife was pregnant and it was dark it was at night and he had a, a, a number of flock, you know, sheep and so on. They began to disperse because uh, it, it, he was not able to kind of somehow keep them. And uh, his wife began to have contractions, pains of labor. Picture yourself in that scenario. Definitely no, no 999. No chance to call for help. You are in the middle of a desert. It's dark. It's cold. You have nobody, and your wife is, uh, is pregnant, and she's having contractions, and your sheep is going away. You know, you're trying to hold them all together. Yes? Very difficult. Extremely stressful, isn't it? Narrations tell us that he tried to ignite some fire, but he couldn't. It was so cold, it was always extinguished. He tried to do something, but he was unable to solve the situation. So he was, in fact, in real trouble. And uh, I, when I was reflecting on these ayat, I think sometimes it's important to press the pause button in our lives and to think about it. Sometimes we do, we do go through certain stages or areas in our lives where it is so dark, it is so cold, and we feel helpless, and there's no one to help us, yes? And then we're struck with something even more difficult. And you say to God, oh God, I can't take it anymore. You know, one of them is okay, four of them at the same time. Yeah? A person loses his job, then falls ill, then, God forbid, loses his wife or children, and so on and so forth. One after the other, and they're thinking, what else could go wrong here? Yeah? And it's a, it's a beautiful scenario, isn't it? Allah wa ta'ala wants us to reflect on that. Musa alayhi salam, in that particular capacity, yes? What did he do? What did the Almighty say to him to do? Yeah? And it's very intriguing and 
prudent for us to actually reflect on this particular scenario because the Quran tells us that when the human being is in trouble there is no way for them to save themselves other than by returning back to God. So uh, beautifully in uh, chapter 9, Surah Tawbah, Allah t- subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the story of the three. You know the three individuals who did not join the Prophet in the Battle of Tabuk. Yeah? They said, we don't want to. The Prophet said, why? They said, because we have wealth, uh, our families to look after business, you know, all that. And they stayed. But they were very remorseful later. And they separated themselves in the mountain and they beseeched Allah for forgiveness and Tawbah and so on. But the Quran tells us the key here, the element when it comes to difficulty. Allah says, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ Beautiful description. Allah says, the earth became very tight for them. Well, the earth is wide. But it's a reference to their lives because they live on this earth, yes? So it becomes incredibly intolerable, becomes hard, difficult, painful. Not only was it painful, they themselves, their souls, was going through hardship. So it's a reflection of the stages of difficulties they were going through. They recognized that there is no way to solve this problem, malja, to have some kind of place of refuge, except to go back to God. Then he says, liyatubu. He did Tawbah on them first, then they did Tawbah. That's why ulama say Tawbah has three stages. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq to seek forgiveness. Then we seek forgiveness, then he accepts the forgiveness. Some people don't ask for Tawbah because the Almighty has not given them permission to do so. They delay it. They call, it's called taswif, procrastination. They delay it. Month of Ramadan, Hajj. You know, later, I'll, I'll get it in my bank account of sins and later on I'll ask Allah for the delete button. Yeah? They think it's like that. They don't know that by accumulating the sins it has a detrimental impact on our souls and on our lives. But inshaAllah ta'ala, we will discuss what Musa alayhi salam was told to do next week. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallillahumma wa sallam ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.